Welcome to the Hustle Never Dies podcast, where we interview entrepreneurs of all areas of life who share the stories, strategies, and wisdom to help you on your entrepreneurial journey. I'm your host, Breon Wishart, and you know today I have the opportunity to interview somebody that's special in my life. You know what I mean? Somebody that motivates and inspires me to be a better person, also a better entrepreneur. Today we'll be discussing a variety of topics, including fashion, systemic racism, partnerships, and fatherhood. So, you know, expect a full episode of great stories and takeaways that will help you become a better entrepreneur and a better person. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first guest on the Hustle Never Dies podcast, the one and only George Sully. What's going on? What's going on? Oh, my man. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks for, for being me. here, man. For sure, for sure. Definitely an honor. To thank have you. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Like I said, first of all, you know, I just want to thank you for being here. I know you're a busy guy, but um, based on our relationship, how long I've known you, how much respect I have for you, for me, it was only right to have you as our first guest on the podcast. I think you have an interesting story crazy work ethic, and I think uh, our audience and our listeners and our viewers can learn a lot from you. Let's jump right into it, man, because, you know, the people here, they're here for the gems, right? You know, your background is Haitian, and, you know, growing up, I've always heard about how Haitians are hardworking people. So what has Haiti and the beautiful people of that island taught you about, you know, adversity and work ethic? Work ethic for sure. Um, I mean, you know, I was born in Canada. My parents uh, were born and raised in Haiti. Uh, my older brother and sister were born in Haiti, moved to Canada, then had uh, my brother Al and myself. Um, you know, we're a family of entrepreneurs, and uh, I think the uh, the Haitian blood runs thick and deep on that on that grind. You know, we were the first to gain our independence in the Antiles. You know what I mean? Helped others. Uh, you know, fight and defeat, you know what I mean, for their own independence, and we got punished for that. So it's one of those things that these are things that, like, I mean, as we look at the situations now today, it's funny how, it, you know, it very, you know, it's parallel to a lot of the things about, um, you know, being punished for greatness sometimes, you know what I mean? And ever since they won that, uh, you know, their independence, they've been punished. Uh, designers like ourselves, as black designers, uh, you know, we don't have a problem with excellence. Excellence is already here. It's the opportunities that are far and few in between. And um, I feel that's a sort of punishment that we've gotten because of our excellence. Yeah. So hard work and absolutely. You know, from, from being around a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, creatives, designers, I always found that like there was two common stories for the entrepreneurs. Either they were working corporate and they didn't enjoy their job or they were broke and out of necessity, they needed to create a product to make money. What's your story as an entrepreneur? I started out, out in music. Uh, for music, um, I gravitated towards fashion. And simply because there was really no money in music. I mean, they say there's no money in music now, but there is. It's just you have to finesse it a certain way, right? Um, but at the time, there was really no money in music. So then I gravitated towards fashion. From fashion, gravitated towards shoes, right? And... Again, I've always had that hustle in me. You know, it, it, it was a natural thing. I never wanted to work for anybody else. The last job I had, which was my first job, which was my last job, was just like, you know, I mean, dish at like St. Hubert's in, in Ottawa, Canada, 20 years ago. Third, well, I don't want to date myself, but a long time ago. So it's one of those things that, um, you know, it, it's, it's some people do it because of necessity. I did it because my family background, we we're entrepreneurs. We're entrepreneurs first. I, I looked at my parents. I saw it through them. I saw that grind through them, and I just emulated their grind. And, you know, by the time I got at an age where I can work and do my thing, it's just like, yo, you know, I use certain monies to flip other things and to flip other things into other things. And then here I am. It's easy. The rest is <laughs> history. The rest is history. <laughs> okay. Now, now, I know you, and, I mean, I consider you a jack-of-all-trades, master of all. Right? There's a lot of things you do. And you're great at them. Now, with all that potential to do anything, why did you choose fashion? Well, 
again, I like to call myself a multidisciplinary designer. That's, that's a lot of things, right? And, uh, you know, I chose fashion because, again, I saw some sort of a template. You know what I mean? Diddy did it when he was in music, and then he transferred it to fashion, and he blended the two. So I saw a path there, and I took that path, right? But then fashion just opens you up to just about anything. And when you're talking about computers and you're talking about softwares, I mean, like, anything you do, you're going to end up working with Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign, After Effects, Adobe Premiere. Those are the basics that can create anything. I could be an interior designer. I can be a musician. I can be a graphic designer. I can be a, a shoemaker, a clothing designer. These are all the same facets. So it's the same computer, multiple uses for it. You know, same software, multiple uses for it. So it's kind of like choosing, to say I chose fashion, I really, actually, I just chose, you know, um, I used to, people used to tell me to stick in one lane, stay to one thing, and I'm just like, that's crazy. And funny enough, I did a whole bunch of things, and then at the time, I was like, yo, how do I identify myself? And then they came up with this really cool word, multimedia. And I was like, yeah, that's the word, that's the word. It wasn't a word till it was. And I'm like, that, that's me. And it was easy for me to understand um, or to, to not only like help you know, acknowledge that lane that I'm in, but just to embrace it and to go hard with it. So then fashion, yes, but you know, we're talking about all the other elements around fashion, um, you know, uh, uh, being the vendor, being the manufacturer, being the producer, being the seller, being all these different things in fashion, uh, being the graphic designer, the videographer, all these other things that lend itself to that group of things. So, yeah. Okay. So, as an entrepreneur, a lot of times we feel isolated when, you know, starting and running a business in the beginning. How did you manage that when you started? Good question. Um, to be honest, I always liked the isolation, to be honest. I liked being alone because, you know, when I was younger, uh, there was more, how do I say, people around or, or group settings where we have to make group decisions. And when you're somebody who's always known the right way, but then having to have to share it with, you know, with the group census. There was a lot of running into brick walls, but then you know you had the answer. So when I had the opportunity to kind of separate myself and become, you know, how do I say, you know, when they say too, too many chefs in the kitchen, when I became my own chef, I was able to, you know, master my own meals. <laughs> you know what I mean? Craft my own meals. And it's one of those things that when you're confident, then, you know, being alone is not too much of a bad thing. And again, when you learn different acumen and when you have that thing, it's actually power. And um, eventually, of course, like any business, you scale, right? And then you add people along, but you add people that understand that you've already at a level where they can't chime in when, you know, when they're, they're not asked to. Slow the process down. Slow the process down. Yeah. Very important. All right. So, you know, I'm sure you use Amazon Prime. Of course. <laughs> of course. You know, the, the founder of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, you know, he once said, don't tell people what you're going to do. Do it and shock them. And then after shocking them, stay silent. Move on to the next project. Keep shocking them. Keep enjoying it. As somebody that moves in silence like a ninja, you know, why is it important to keep your ideas to yourself? Uh, it's very important to keep the ideas to yourself simply because you might still be, you know, manifesting them. You know, it's, 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 it's always a process. An entrepreneur, you might not always have it right or have the idea ready to go. So it's better that you keep it silent until you have it worked out and then you present it. Do not, you know, how do you say, do not start a pre-order if your stuff is still on the boat on the other side of the, wa uh, the, other side of the water or haven't even got on the boat. You have to make sure, even if you start a pre-order, make sure that you have two days before it lands on, on shore. And that's the same the same general idea for anything. Make sure you're ready before you present because, or before you start talking about it, better have it. Um, uh, that's, you know, they, they say in business, um, you know, page 101, first page of the book of business is perception is everything in business, right? So the perception of it. Um, if you fulfill that perception, you become the reality of it. So it's kind of like, hey, you know, just be ready. If you say it, do it, right? Very important. Um, and uh, I know for me, uh, secrecy is everything. A lot of the youth, a lot of the younger brands like to share, share, share. They share right up until their idea gets jacked, and then they complain that, man, that was my idea. Wait, that was, but wait, you had a tutorial on TikTok saying how you did it. 
So why are you surprised that everyone's doing something and leapfrogging you over your opportunity? Don't let people leapfrog over your opportunity. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Keep your ideas to yourself. And like, and like George said, make sure it's ready to go. Make sure it's fully manifested. It's ready. What does it mean to be an entrepreneur in 2021 during a pandemic? And what's your greatest takeaway so far? Um, I didn't have to pivot too much during the pandemic, but for those who needed to, it's about, you never know what's going to come. You don't ever, never know what's going to be around the corner. So being prepared, prepared, prepared for anything, right? Um, having some money in the bank, knowing where your product's going to sit, how it sits, who are you selling it to, how much inventory are you ordering, just being prepared. And again, I didn't have to pivot, but understanding that you have, you might have to, you might have to make changes. And Furthermore, after after COVID, uh, keeping that mentality of knowing you always have to be uh, um, you have to be light on your toes, you have to be light on your feet, and uh, know that you have to make a move left or right, pivot, uh, act like a speedboat, not like a freight. You know what I mean? Uh, freighters are slow, slow to turn. If something's coming, they can't move in time. They're most likely going to get jacked. They're most likely going to get hit. So. Um, I think that's very important. Great answer. Um, with all that's happened over the last three, four years, bringing attention to systemic racism and police brutality, people have always believed that racism was an issue that only black Americans faced, which is definitely not the case. Um, I've personally dealt with racism in Canada, and even though it isn't highlighted like it is in America, it's real, and it's been going on for a long time. Tell us about some of your experience of racism in the fashion industry specifically and how you were able to overcome them? Well, it's funny because somebody asked me the question once, you know, if you could speak or ask, you know, give your younger self some advice or what would you say to your younger self? And, and I replied, basically, it's hard as a Canadian black designer to answer that question because I would probably tell them I didn't have to do, like, I didn't have to learn anything. I, my younger self was ready. It's just Canada wasn't ready to accept success that looks like me. So how do you tell your younger self of, oh, you know, you could have did better or do this or do that? Actually, I would tell my younger self nothing. You did great. <laughs> keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. I couldn't tell my younger self um, there's going to be some racism. You're going to be marginalized. You're going to have a knee on your neck most of the time. You're going to be designing in the dark most of the time. All these things. These are things that you can't control. I can control what I can do as a younger self. And examples of, um, you know, racism and systemic racism is, you know, not getting the buyer's meetings, you know, not getting these things that are readily available to everybody else. Uh, excuses. Um, and this hurts businesses. This hurts brands because, uh, you know, sure, you're online and so on and so forth, but it's kind of like not having all the tools that's available to everybody else sucks because you see growth in other brands and other businesses simply because they're not just a one-trick pony. They're not just online or selling out of your house or, <laughs> you know, um, pop-ups, right? You need department stores, and not you need. It's just having the option or having the ask. I'd rather them ask me and me say I don't need it than being shut out completely that we are not worthy of. Um, and it goes to the whole um, table and, you know, being invited to the table. And people say, well, you should make your own table. And I say, wait a second. I helped build the one that, you know, uh, the legs on which it stands. I built that table, too. I have an investment in the table that they're using without me. They're eating on something that I can't eat on. It makes it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. So so it's very important um, when we're talking about that table is that. I'm building all types of tables, right? But there's that one table that I keep on talking about that we've never been invited to, but we've helped build. And that's the most important thing I want all entrepreneurs to know. You could build whatever table you want, but when they've promised and there's a table that you helped build that you're not included on and you can't eat from, that's the problem that we are now quailing, so to speak. We, we are getting there now and we're being put on a table. And when I eat my belly full of it, I'll continue to work on all the other tables that I'm building by myself with others that believe in the same things that I do, right? You know, and, that, and that's a great segue into my next question, which is black design as a Canada. 
um, the first ever interactive digital index of Canadian black designers. And, you know, as some as someone with a full plate already, you know, what initiated it and why did you feel that the platform was necessary now and not 10 years ago? It would have never worked 10 years ago. And the reason why is because Canada never owned up to and or admitted to systemic racism and racism in itself. It was one of those things that we should believe that Canada is a beautiful place and is acceptance of everybody and love, peace, hockey skates, and maple syrup. But the problem is, is that it could only work when somebody admits to the problem. You can't solve something that somebody doesn't want to admit to, that there is a problem. Nobody, you know. So June 2020 was very important because for the first time after the, you know, well, George Floyd, there was a lot of, you know, unfortunate accidents with the police and violence, but George Floyd was 100% filmed in the daylight in front of witnesses, unfiltered. And when we all got to see that together as a, as a, as a collective, I guess, that's when it was time because then we could finally say, see, look at what this is. And this is happening in all types of businesses and all types of um, uh, different industries. The same type thing. We use the knee on the neck. We've had our, the knee on the neck for a long time and a lot of businesses that we, that we work in. So this thing, um, I started it because finally Canada admitted to their and or ownership, took an, taken ownership to systemic racism. And then I could work. Now I could work because having conversations in a church community center basement wasn't the look because we were talking to ourselves. Oh, we got to do this and we got to rise. We got to rise to where nobody's listening to you because they're not admitting to what you're talking about. Now they're admitting to it. Now we work. And that's why I started Black Designers of Canada because I can work. I can amplify voices of the marginalized based on the fact that I can now say, see, now that you're admitting to this, now I could show you what you could admit to, what you are now admitting to, and see the destruction and see what is caused. Not admitting this, seeing all these things. And they embraced it because they had no choice. Uh, you can call it what you want, but finally putting over 200 black designers in front of your face and say, this is what you have to deal with. This is what you're saying didn't exist. And now here they are. So deal with it. And uh, now we're still, the, re, the, re, the reper, not repercussions, but the reverberations of what has happened because of Black Designers of Canada has changed everything in the industry, everything. From high end to low end to medium businesses to everything has changed it all. And just by saying we are here and this is what you've missed. Beautiful platform. Um, I'm honored to have, you know, the brand featured on there. So a few months ago, you revealed the Black Designers of Canada Award of Excellence, and you handed out over 100 awards. Um, I have mine, and, you know, it's my first and most important award because it's for us, from us, right? And um, I cherish it with everything, man. It means a lot to me. And, you know, I wanted to shout out the team at The Hustle Never Dies for putting in all the work that helped us get that award. You know, it wasn't just a, a, an award that you were just handing out to everybody. You actually had to earn it. So to know that we received it, just kind of, you know, let us know that we're putting in the work and it's paying off. So thank you for that. So what gave you the inspiration to do this? A lot of good questions today. A lot of good questions. Um, basically... I don't look at it as for the ego's sake, something, a piece of glass to maybe put on your front mantle just for sake of. Uh, it goes deeper than that. It goes into um, not being acknowledged. And in any other accessible universe where we should and we already would have been acknowledged, we are not being acknowledged. And in 2022, understanding that we are still at a place where we are so many but so least celebrated is crazy, right? Um, so it just made sense that now that I've so-called uncovered so much talent, what do you do with it? We can't leave it to others to try to slowly pick us up and put us in something that they never, they never expected to put us into and try to make up for lost time. That would take 20, 30 years. 
we're over 200. That means any per- proverbial award show only has a couple of categories. You'd have to space that out for 30 years to get everybody worthy. So uh, Black Designers of Canada, the award of excellence was to recognize and to uplift and more strategically to put award winning in front of designers that should have already been awarded a long time ago. So when you're going into a buyer's meeting, you're an award winning designer and they're going to have to take your word for it by looking at, is he worthy enough or is she worthy enough? And then they looked like they are. It justifies the award. It justifies the talent. It justifies the excellence. The problem is with the system is that you go to a buyer and you sit down, you finally get your meeting and they ask you, well, I don't see too much press. I don't see you in the press. And that's important to us because we need the press. We need the hype on your brand because, you know, sales have been really down and we're looking for brands that are already there. The problem is, is that we're already, the system is rigged where the press doesn't cover black designers. And I mean press, I'm talking about very uh, popular press. Press that actually turns the engine to make generational wealth. That should be available to all of us, right? We're in Canada, right? So you don't get press. That means you're out of the contingent. You go to your buyer's meeting, they're asking you for press. You don't get any. It's a circle now. You get your meeting, they ask you for press. You don't have any press, you don't get press. So they locked us out. It's a plausible deniability of, oh, the reason why I didn't get you because you don't have press. But of course you don't have press because it's on purpose. It wasn't by accident. That's That's sickening the 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 feeling it's a sickening feeling understanding that you're locked out of something and they use it against you they use something that you're locked out of against you knowing that there's no way to get to what they're asking for because they're not going to get it that's called designing in the dark basically so um having the award is basically breaking down a lot of those walls and saying hey I am recognized, and you're going to, again, have to take my word for it by actually having to look at my work. Why are you an award-winning designer? Why? They're going to ask. And then they're going to have to make the decision, and this is where we hold them over a barrel. They're going to have to make the decision, and there's only one decision. For you to be onboarded, that's it. But if they say no, now this is where we get to the, it's bad on you, and now we have a record of you saying no to something that is excellent. That's tough to deny. All right, so you, you've partnered with some great companies like Hudson's Bay, Amazon Prime, LG, DHL, and Salesforce, to name a few. You know, what does your vetting process look like when you're considering partnerships and collaborations? I think it's simple. Um, just looking at me as an individual, um, you know, coming to me with ideas that generally vibe with me and my product and my ideas. Um, um, It's very important that anybody you connect yourself with is aligned with your ideas. Um, And so even if it looks performative or tokenism, the important thing is, is that if they are really coming at you, or in this case at me, and are aligned with my beliefs and what I believe in, then that means then people are going to have to look deeper into it and, un- and, 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 understand, like, and understand why these collaborations are happening. And they'll understand that, let's say, like, use DHL, for example. DHL liked where I was going with what I was doing. So they not only couldn't collaborate with me, but they asked the proper questions. And they gave me the, the, the right tools to help Black Designers of Canada. Very important, right? And a lot of people were even surprised when DHL was calling them and saying, how are you? How can we help you as an individual? This is your business. What can we do? Instead of a easy promotion or the yellow and red, you know what I mean? And then they move on. And they're still working with us now. And we're expanding on helping Black Designers of Canada. We're expanding constantly. And that's what I look for in a collaboration. I look for just understanding. So recently... TD Canada surprised you with the mural for your lifelong work in fashion and community. 
tell us about the experience and, you know, what it feels like to receive your flowers now for all your accomplishments so far. I think it's great. I'm, I'm happy that I didn't have to die first. <laughs> and that's <laughs> as, plain as, as plain as day. Um, I'm, I'm happy, and it's just the beginning. Uh, TD came on board and, and, you know, they wanted to do a feature and so on and so forth. And they, they surprised me with, you know, the little the, the added extra and every bit counts, but it's only the beginning. You know, we're having talks already about going deeper. And this is the thing where, you know, you might say, oh, they surprised me with X, Y, Z, but are they doing enough? See, that's not, don't worry about that because this is where I come in and what I need from collaborations and the support that I'm looking for, that's covered. So it's, you know, we're talking about earlier about secretiveness and ninjaism. It's very important that you might have the questions of why and how and how much, but I got that covered. And that comes out when it comes out. And the cool thing is that people should know is that, again, I put everybody on, you know, I'm not going to say on blast or on notice or on whatever, but... Um, I keep corporations on their toes, so to speak. I make sure that, you know, well, they don't even really have to. These days, <laughs> they're, they're, they're on, their, on their best behavior, but most importantly, I'm only going to work with brands and corporations that really see me and see eye to eye with what I'm doing, and TD does, and I'm looking forward to continuing to work with TD and, and what we have in store for Black Designers of Canada and BIPOC brands in general, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's a very powerful thing. I appreciate what they did. Uh, the mural is great. Um, 1080 Queen Street West, I think, is where you can find it. It's a beautiful thing. It's up for a year. So anyways, yeah. You always speak about, you know, legacy work and interviews and, and, and on social media. What kind of legacy do you want to leave when it's all said and done? How do I say a more inclusive foundation? More inclusive platform for everybody? Um, Hopefully, something like my son will have to experience when he grows older because there will be so much open, so many open doors for him to just start, you know, from ground, like from, from, from ground zero, have an easier platform to just build and be creative, right? Um, and we're all creative. And again, I, 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 we are excellent. We all have our, our points of excellence. It's not the problem, it's the opportunities. When he grows up, I wanna leave something behind that just, again, makes an easier playing field to get into. And I, I, I already now, I already see his friends and it's just like, you know, you can't, it's just, you can't see an unmixed kid in a bunch. <laughs> There's not an unmixed kid. And it's a beautiful thing that he will grow up being, well, Dad, what were you talking about? What do you mean the first black this and the first thing this and the first, like, it's everywhere all the time. Like, you know what I mean? He's yeah. going to, and I want, like, of course he needs to know his history. It's very important what we were trying to do. But it's going to be amazing for him to grow up in a place, and I can already see it happening, where inclusion is number one on the agenda yeah. for the day. You know, speaking about his future, what are some of the entrepreneurial skills you're currently giving him? At a young age. Well, you know, first and foremost, you know what I mean? He loves, uh, you know, shout out to Love Every. Um, it's, a, it's a platform of toys that help in cognitive and physical and all these really cool type of things that's really helped, again, fast forward his, his acumen. Like his, his, he's just a really smart ass kid. And shout out to them. But I think entrepreneurial wise is kind of like, He's at a stage where he likes to do a lot of things, like his daddy, a multi, multi, multidisciplinary kid. And he likes to do many of things, and I think it's important as a father or as a mother or just a parent in general to celebrate whatever they're doing and treat them as equals. Treat them as human and not babies gaga goo goo because I think that's the biggest mistake. And I'm not going to tell how to raise people to raise their children, but I'll tell you that if you raise them as an equal as just a human being then you will get so much more you'll be so much more satisfied and again you know we don't talk in baby talk we talk in real terms and real and that's so he learns life in real terms he speaks in real terms that way he's uh he's almost three but he's fluent he speaks he speaks he has his personality and all these things and 
Um, I think just, I celebrate everything he does because like art, it's relative, right? Yeah. So a 50 year old um, established artist will draw a red strike across uh, a canvas. And then at Sotheby's they'll, they'll auction off for a million dollars. My son, whether it's, it's, it's relative, whether it's a scribble or whether it's raw talent or whether it's hmm, abstract, I treat it the same way as anything else. It's beautiful. I'm put up on a wall. I'll put up on a wall because if I celebrate him as an equal now, he'll always know that whatever direction he goes into, he'll always be lifted. And he'll always be supported in whatever he does. And, you know, who knows if that's beautiful? It's relative to what you think is beautiful and to, to what the other person thinks is beautiful. And um, when people come into my house and they see uh, a five by five foot painting and it's his own and they don't know it's him, well, guess what? That's amazing. Sully, that, that, that's amazing. Who's, a, who's the designer? <laughs> that's my son. He's two. Hi, Adrian. Why don't you come over here and tell him about your painting? Yeah. And that's perspective, Right. And I love this world because it's kind of like I treat him that as such. So he gets that respect as such. So when somebody comes into your house, they're like giving it the respect that they would respect that person who's selling at Sotheby's for a million dollars. Now, now we both know, you know, little man is a star in the making, but we can't forget about his mom. Um, who's the boss lady as well. Shout out Hyla. Um, what are some tips that you could give us about being in business with your partner? Specifically, what does it take to make it work? I think it's simple. I think it just takes understanding. It takes understanding. It takes, um, you know, having both partners involved and, you know, just and having a good time doing it. Because if you're not having a good time doing it, I mean, I mean, in my scenario, it's a family business. Right. So I'm talking about generational wealth. No matter what happens, there's something that she can go off with and understand that she has security no matter what. Right. Um, and that's what I have always wanted in a partnership, in a family and in a partnership, right? Um, sure, I have my own companies and so on and so forth, but um, where House of Hyla is concerned, and even, you know, where Sully and Son is, you know, that's for my son. That's something I can give to him and say, hey, this is yours, right? House of Hyla, I can give to Hyla and say, this is yours. And then I'm left with nothing. Saying, okay, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, again, you know, House of Hyla, we're 50-50 on, but more, more importantly than that, it's something that she can wake up in the mornings and know she has some sort of accountability to something. It's very important for people to wake up and not just be passive about life. You got to know that people are walking around the streets with your name on it, with shoes with your name on it. That's a lot of responsibility for every mistake or thing or whatever, you know, like positive or negative, ups or downs, you are accountable. And she loves that because that's what being an entrepreneur is, accountability. You put out a product with your name on it, it's very important that you represent. And if you make a mistake, you fix it. That helps a whole lot of how things are run in our family, right? And um, absolutely. And, and uh, lately, she's, she's, um, she's always been a photographer, but she's taken on that, that responsibility a lot more. And I love it because she's been shooting a lot for Sully and Son. She's been shooting for a lot for House of Hyla. She's been shooting a lot for Adrian's um, project. Um, and to make it work is just, you know, being on the same page. And, um, you know, when things are not, things are not always perfect. But just communication and understanding is everything. And you can make it work. Yeah. Family business. John Maxwell, he once said, getting older is automatic. Getting better is not. How do you stay sharp as an entrepreneur? Well, keeping your ear to the streets. Keeping your ear to the streets. And there's always new talent coming out. And it's not shunning them. It's embracing them. And it's learning off them as well. Uh, they're coming off of new technologies, faster ways to do things, faster ways to express themselves. Um, they're beasts. I was a beast at a time when there was none of that, but you didn't know there was none of that because we couldn't see the future. We worked with what we had. But with these 
brands and these kids coming out right now, it's just kind of like there's so much to learn off of. At the same time, you know, it's amazing how we have all these talents and acumen. Now, if you just channel these talents that you already have into what's new in technology, not only you can compete, but you can, again, overachieve in a situation where you think that, you know, you're slowing down or, you know, and, you know, um, and things are passing you by and brands are just coming left, right, and center. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a pleasure, actually, and it, it gives great energy seeing new brands and new ideas. And, I mean, you can't be mad at that. And uh, I would say to any OG or anybody out there who is, uh, who's been doing this for a while, uh, use it as fuel and not as, you know, uh, a dead stop to anything. Lastly, give me one piece of advice you have for our entrepreneurs and designers out there. There's a lot, but I would say, um, and you can believe me now more than any other time in the history of us, is sky's the limit. Um, before, there might have been a cap. If I might have told you that five, six years ago, there might have been a cap to that, and I might have been lying to you. Um, now, sky's is the limit because um, things have changed, and things are changing, right? And being ready for this change and being ready for opportunities that are coming that I can guarantee tell you that they weren't here before. When I talk about like a ceiling, there's a glass ceiling and that was that for us. And I could tell my son now at least and anybody else listening out there, sky is really the limit and it's what you make of it, right? And um, so much more challenges to go, but that's what entrepreneurship is. That's what being an entrepreneur is about. It's about challenges, high highs, low lows. Ride the middle, and you'll be okay. You'll learn how to deal with both, right? So, um, absolutely. I think um, sky's the limit, and just, uh, you know, keep your ear to the ground. Okay, so how do our viewers and listeners follow you? You can go to uh, www.georgesully.com. You can go to my Instagram, Real George Sully. Um, there's a link in the bio. It's a link tree link. It gives you all the links to everywhere. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for joining us on our first episode of the Hustle Never Dies podcast. Thank you again, George Sully. Check him out. Like he said, georgesully.com. And um, catch you on the next one. Peace.